All right, I think we're there. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wasm Cloud Wednesday for uh, Wednesday, July 19th. Uh, we got the agenda up on screen now, and I actually found out that you can link in the live stream before it even starts, like on the video. So on all of the all the socials and things we put out, the agenda, uh, the meeting is already going to be here. I'm not going to click it so we don't get like a infinite mirror effect here. But today on the agenda, we're going to start with a. Uh, I'm not sure if if Jordan has a, a fully fledged demo or just a little bit of an update on the. Uh, Witified providers, something that we started talking about last week that we've kind of promised weekly updates on. I think it's moving so quickly and it's such an exciting effort. It, it's a good thing for us to check in, at least uh, during the community meetings for now. And then a discussion a little bit later about, I saw a question and, and a little bit of confusion and, and looking into it a little more on the Wasm Cloud Slack. We definitely could use a little more discussing and, and process around RFCs and ADRs. And so I have a little bit of discussion planned there, but that will come later for now. I think I'll go ahead and hand it to Jordan who can give an update on Witified providers. Thank you, Brooks. Uh, where's the right screen? Uh, this looks good. Why live streaming is terrible. I hope nothing important was on my desktop. Um, this one, maybe ping pong, ping pong. That's it. Okay. Um, so last week I shared, um, pretty much this exact example <clears throat> showing wash call, uh, in the, you know, triggering the actor that the ping and that the provider was doing, um, uh, health calls. However, uh, not soon after that, um, I call 1-800-BROOKS, help me. And we were able to debug the final um, message pack error. And while I do not have it up and running anywhere, um, I did post an update in Slack. So essentially now we um, we do have a, within the Wasm Cloud OTP uh, host, um, a provider and an actor that is able to communicate uh, using WIT, generated uh, files or WIT generated contracts, which is really exciting. So um, my natural next step, which might not be natural, but my next step from there was Slack. There we go. So I put in this, I put this little update and if you go in Slack, it's, it's in Wasm Cloud. It's not very long ago. So you should be able to find it by scrolling up not too far. Um, I shared the ping pong example. I shared the provider SDK uh, edits that were, you know, moving from uh, Smithy to WIT contracts. And then um, a small update of kind of where I was going from there. <clears throat> uh, so the, the next thing, the next natural step in this process is Smithy generates all of the encoding, decoding, everything you need for Wasm Cloud. Um, it's built into the weld crate. Um, however, we do not have that capability for uh, WIT generated contracts yet. Um, so I believe we're calling this WASI fill, uh, which is essentially the code generation from WIT specifically for Wasm Cloud, and that's you know the encoding, decoding, message pack type stuff. Um, so, to my final update, Bailey will can will correct me if I just said any of that incorrectly. But um, in order to do that, I had to be able to uh, parse a WIT file, and that is not the right screen to share. Sorry. Yeah, nope, that one. Yep, cool. Um, and the only thing that exists right now is a wit parser written in Rust. Um, that uh, is very it, that is published on the Bytecode Alliance's uh, GitHub, and I didn't want to use that one very specifically because I, I don't know Rust. So I've spent the last two days, and I have essentially rewritten 
most of the wit parser in Go. So now it's like native, uh, a native Go uh, library. And you can run through and all the tests are passing right now. So you can kind of see like, uh, this is the parser, but you can kind of see like uh, where it's, you know, all the, the special uh, result and option types are represented in here. And if you go back to like, and if you're, you're curious what the grammar looks like, um, here are all the tokens very specific to uh, wit. And we have Alexa in there as well, which tokenizes everything. So essentially my update in a nutshell is um, I almost have a parser that's going to let me, allow me to start generating WASI fill hopefully by next week. No promises on that. Um, however, I'm trying my best to by next Wednesday have at least a demo of some sort of WASI fill. Uh, and once we have that, we will be able to uh, wrap that in wash and then wash generate, we'll be able to look at a WIT file and generate all the language specific code for WASM Cloud. And that is all. Thanks, Jordan. I am super excited. Um, uh, I, um, I, Brooks, do you mind giving me share screen? I think there are a few things that we should probably like explain, right? Because you are in the weeds. Like it is deep. You've done a deep dive. You are in the guts. You're writing a parser. Uh, but it is super valuable because uh, one, um, WIT is a standard that we're working on uh, within the W3C and the WebAssembly WASI working group. And so that WIT is, uh, WIT is part of the, the IDL that we're using to define our high-level interfaces. Uh, Brooks, I see you have your hand raised. I had a question, but I'm happy to do it after. I, it's not no. contingent on what Jordan was. No, definitely ask your question. Um, and okay. I, I'll pull up, I'm going to pull up a diagram to talk through some of the things Jordan just uh, explained. Okay. I, I just wanted to ask, because um, I, I know, uh, Jordan, you, you mentioned in, in the beginning that you wrote this because there is a wit parser written in Rust. Um, I, I wanted to know if there's any part of the Go wit parser that, that you're writing now that could, could could be contributed upstream to the bytecode alliance like for go code generation from from wit i mean i know that some of this is the the inception of some of this work here is to make it so that like wit providers can work for go and some of those things will work for for tiny go um Really, what I'm trying to get at is, I think it would be really awesome if we can contribute some of this stuff upstream to help out with like the code generation on the like uh, on the um, bytecode alliance side. If it would be, it would be useful. Yeah. So um, the parser itself, right, is just essentially going to be what is a port of the existing parser. Um, however. The, and yes, it, so it could very well go to the Bytecode Alliance if they want it. Um, the only, the, the one thing it adds, right, is the ability to remove CGO from the uh, equation, right? Because right now, if we wanted to write a, uh, write the WASI fill uh, creator in, in Go for Go, what we would do is we'd go get the Rust one, we generate the C bindings, and then we didn't, you know, import them via C Go. Um, and while that's all fine and dandy, uh, I don't love working with C Go, and I know a lot of other people don't either. Uh, so, so this effort kind of um, just makes makes the Go more of like a something, you know, I don't, I don't know if first class citizen is the right word, but that's what I'll say. But to answer your question, yes, uh, this can be all upstream because there should be no, you know, the Rust wit parser should generate the same AST as this parser. But to rephrase it, it's a secondary implementation of something that already exists within the Bytecode Alliance. Uh, but like Jordan said, gophers want a Go native experience and they want to contribute using Go to build Go to, to build things on top of it. And so 
uh, I think it's incredibly valuable, A, for any standard to have a second implementation of something, right? Always. Um, so this is a huge uh, contribution. Uh, and two, I think, you know, Bytecode Alliance could be a place to upstream, but there are actually a, a lot of really great Go ecosystems and communities that are building around uh, WASM and WIT, uh, and this might make sense for, for some of those folks to adopt. So all I'm saying is I think Jordan's about to get a bunch of internet points, um, which matters, right? Uh, so uh, to kind of explain a little bit more when we're talking about what some of those things are, uh, so in this case, we're talking about if somebody builds a component, they're talking to uh, a WIT definition, which uh, explains what the imports and exports are of that component. And this is a diagram that Steve made, and I really love it. And we first showed it off uh, at WASM.io in March uh, of this year. Uh, but if you think of components and their interface definitions as shapes that you plug together, like Lego bricks, essentially, uh, where the host uh, or another component has to plug in and fulfill um, all of those uh, nubbins <laughs> that you see, basically, um, so that they plug in directly. And so when we're talking about um, in the WASM Cloud space for what capabilities we want to implement. With WASM Cloud, we support distributed capabilities, and we make it so that it's not part of the host process. That's incredibly valuable because if you think about it, it's these clients, right? This Redis client, and HTTP client, a lot of these, those are the things that have a CVE. And this box here is my sandbox. The it's the host that implements the whole sandbox. So if I make it as part of that process, uh, I am opening myself up to uh, a place where that I have to manage those vulnerabilities and come up with ways to sandbox it. Um, but additionally, uh, it can it can be a little bit limiting in, in terms of being able to rev this version and, and needing to rev uh, this specific Redis client for uh, everyone, right, um, at the same time. So uh, having to update the entire host every time this piece changes. And so with Wasm Cloud, uh, we have decoupled that um, in a way that lets us build components. And this little shape here uh, represents what we've been calling a WASI fill. Um, because a lot of these interfaces are uh, defined via WASI, um, uh, but really, you know, and maybe a WASM fill might be a better name here because uh, we're not uh, polyfilling in or adapting uh, WASI interfaces. We're doing this for our custom capability providers, so for custom contracts that people build for the standard interfaces and standardized ones, the, those will be natively supported within the host. But uh, part of our design with uh, the Wasm Cloud host is that uh, we'll allow you to basically plug in these things um, as a separate process and, and be able to make these calls over to um, NATS. And so that's, that's kind of the key thing that Jordan is enabling, is letting us have capability providers here that are written in Go. Any questions? Uh, Bailey. Uh, Bailey, let me ask you a couple of questions here. Um, what's the security boundary for a component? So the security boundary for a component, uh, I would say that the easiest way to describe that is that it's the same as a, a WASM module itself. So the component model builds on top of the WebAssembly core specification, and the component model sits on top of this. And what I mean by that is if I jump down to this diagram, an individual component here, a component instance, is actually a wrapper around a core WASM module. So all of the work that's been put into making core WASM safe and define what a sandbox is and, and how its memory layout works, its tables, its globals, everything, uh, is really um, the exact same. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it's the same thing, except uh, we've got this way of being able to pass in high level types and define how to interact with different component instances. Uh, so in a way, they kind of wrap a core WASM module. Uh, you only have one in the case of shared nothing linking. But for some of the work that Joel Dice has been putting in, he's been exploring how to do shared everything linking where there will be multiple core WASM modules encapsulated by a single component instance. And so other components can only talk to this component through those interfaces, through its imports and exports. And so when you link them together, what you kind of get is something that is one WASM component that has imports and exports. And so when you combine them, the final thing uh, right here, I, I didn't draw it out, but um, the final thing will have a top level exports and imports. 
And so the top level imports will typically be like WASI uh, that you would expect to be fulfilled by the host. Uh, and the typical export would be something like um, run, <laughs> some kind of API that kicks this whole thing off. Vance? And just to be clear, the combining can happen at um, runtime. Yeah, so this supports declarative linking, not um, so you could do static linking, right? You could do that at build time when, when you build things, you know what each one needs. Uh, the host can do this before instantiating it, but that's the key point is that this uh, declarative linking step of composing two modules together needs to happen before it's instantiated because uh, the way that this works is it looks for these imports and exports. And if there's an import that is not fulfilled by the host, so the host says, hey, I've got this .wasm, I wanna run it. Uh, and it looks at it and it says, well, there's some imports here and you didn't fulfill one of these, which is like, it says it needs a file system and you didn't link in a file system. So I'm gonna fail and I can't get instantiated. So you need to do it at least before that step. And how consistent is that between, uh, between runtimes? So right now, the only runtime that has full component support is WASM time, which is the runtime that we use. Uh, the runtimes typically, uh, from most of the ones that I've looked at, don't do this for you. They expect you to give them uh, a composed component if that's what you want. Uh, so it's up to the application platforms to do that composition if it's needed. Uh, so said differently, Fermion, Wasm Cloud, um, everyone <laughs> that builds an app platform will uh, probably do this step uh, for their users. For us, I'm expecting us to do this as part of Wash Build to get started. Um, and, and then what we would get is uh, something that basically knows how to talk and be distributed across a Wasm Cloud ecosystem and support distributed capability providers. Okay. Okay, so you're not like Bytecode Alliance isn't providing any specific guidance on on that part of it. The tool to do the composition uh, is part of the Wasm Tools project. Actually, a lot of this stuff is. Um, all the good stuff is actually in there. And so the tool for doing the composition is there. It's a crate that we're gonna use uh, within Wash. We're gonna embed the Bytecode Alliance tool. Okay, and so um, that was interesting. You say. Specifically, though, it has to do all of it has to be complete at instantiation. So we we can't link in another component later. You wouldn't be able to link in another component that needs to fulfill one of the imports. Right. Okay. But, right. Thank you. But I could see some other options there, some interesting things that I can think about, but um I, I let's just keep it simple for now and say yes. Yep. Okay. Frank. So, um, just to I mean, correct me if I'm if I'm uh, wrong here, but every component will have its own uh, sandbox, so they are secure by that uh, periphery, and so when you build the let's say the composite. It's still each one of them are still completely independent. That's right. So the memories, globals, tables here of this core WASM module uh, can't be accessed by other components. And that's huge, right? That that completely changes the game for how we build applications. And it's, I thank you so much for highlighting that because I think a lot of people miss that detail where we've completely eliminated with the component model and an entire suite of supply chain attacks. Because now you can only talk to each other over these API bind, uh, bind, uh, uh, if I get, I don't have the right word for it, but uh, well, actually, between the imports and exports. Yeah, actually is is attacks and screw ups. Yeah, so you, it definitely you're still gonna have problems about um, SQL injection, for example, if you are not sanitizing the strings that are being passed between the two, I'd like those types of attacks will still remain. Although that's sort of the whole point of the WASI standardization effort behind those APIs uh, of the common set of APIs that people are going to build is that we're going to scrutinize that uh, type of attack vector and make sure that we've designed APIs that keep you safe. Uh, but the, the idea of 
um, you no longer have the case of I build, actually, let me zoom back out. I've got one diagram for this, I think. Here, yeah, no longer am I building an app um, that has pulls in a bunch of different libraries, uh, virtualizing all of Linux. And then my typical app today, right, will have an import for DynamoDB or Kafka, and it's pulling in all of these other libraries. And, and, and this is just one library example, but a typical app is going to have middleware for all the things. And uh, we'll probably access different data sources, talk to a message broker, like maybe Kafka. And so right now what people do is they give it a giant environment config blob with all the keys to the kingdom, every key that I've ever <laughs> created for all the different things that my app needs to talk to. And then every single one of these imports have the exact same access to the exact same keys. So if somebody is smart and does a supply chain attack, they know what the typical uh, key for uh, name for like the AWS keys are to your DynamoDB database and can um, now they've got access. Uh, so uh, you don't necessarily need to protect against those attacks with this model because uh, I'm only going to be passing in the components it the information that it needs to run so it's not going to get a whole bundle of all the keys it's just going to get those properties for what this library says it needs for this one component instance yeah and and now and for the width size um what is the complexity in terms of uh let's say code pass i mean how much uh more uh, let's say in terms of latency and so forth that we're adding by uh, by using this. Yeah, so when you are moving between component instances right here, uh, we've introduced this layer called the canonical ABI. And so the there there's it there's there's no network hop here. Um, however, uh, there's a network hop in Wasm Cloud, obviously, because we're distributed. But uh, as far as in the WIT context, there's no network hop. Uh, and when I compose two components together, the thing that makes it so that those two components can talk to each other is this layer, this canonical ABI binding layer. And what it lets me do is pass strings that are in Rust, you know, written in a Nest Rust native way, and then have a Python component on the other side that has a totally different representation for a string, be able to lift and lower that type between those two different components, which means there are canon operations. So can't uh, can Canon is a word that's now introduced as part of the component model ABI, uh, but there are basically steps for how do I take this type from one component and get it over to another. Uh, but so much of this work can be optimized out, especially if I know that, say, I'm talking to a Rust component and another Rust component, then I know that I don't really necessarily need to do all of that lift and lowering. Uh, so uh, all of that said differently, for most of these operations, it's just a mem copy away extremely efficient, uh, but still sandboxed. Bailey, I, I think you touched on a great point here. Um, and you didn't explicitly say it, but these components, um, as you're, you know, reaching into your block of Legos here can be made out of different languages um, together. Yes, yes, absolutely. So so it, um, how does it um, then it uh, help us to bridge across, you know, all these various language uh, language silos? or take advantage of things that some languages do really well, think like secure high-performance Rust um, paired with easy to use Python code, right? Yeah, so I think what we'll, we'll ultimately see is a lot of folks being able to write in a higher level language uh, that's a lot easier, like Go, Python, those types of things. Um, but now finally be able to ergonomically take advantage of high performance rest, memory safety of rest. And so I think what we'll basically see is the elimination of everybody having to rewrite things so that it's native to their ecosystem silo. Uh, and the step to be able to combine them, that's that composition step I was talking about earlier. Uh, and, and, and the command is really simple. It's Wasm tools compose. Um, so I was hyping Wasm tools earlier. That's the bytecode alliance tool. And, and anytime you see Wasm tools, the CLI, um, and the, the second part here, there's an independent crate for each one of these. So it's really easy for all of the different application platforms to be able to embed it. Vance? So <clears throat> um, as you say, it's, it's local linking, right? But in uh, what what uh, Jordan is doing is 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 different, right? So a different application using WIT uh, to to define the contracts, which 
are distributed. Um, and so the, the thing that's on my mind, uh, after having gone just gone through a deep dive on Smithy contracts and understanding what that was all about, um, or like how it works and how to express things using Smithy, um, uh, what I ran into was the exception handling. And I'm wondering about that here. So I, I think you certainly have different exception handling locally than, than remotely. Um, and if that's not a complete question, uh, I... I just wonder on what the impact is to 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 the application. Yeah, I will say that Smithy is in a lot of ways um, a higher level IDL compared to WIT, which is really focused on defining things in terms of uh, types that the WebAssembly component model knows about. And 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 we're marching towards the first MVP of, of the WIT IDL, but it's important to highlight that it has not reached MVP status. So the verbosity of the things that you can do between Smithy and WIT is pretty different. Um, however, uh, we were able to make a pass through all of our existing Wasm Cloud contracts and feel very confident that we have everything we need to get uh, this working uh, in, in, in an okay way. Uh, there are issues that Jordan has, has filed. Thank you, Jordan, uh, for saying, you know, hey, it, it would be a lot better if I could convert this list to full string to a map type. Um, so, you know, can we get that added? And we were able to discuss with a lot of the WebAssembly folks and um, kind of roadmap that in uh, after this current set that we're working on releasing. Uh, but to answer your question about exception handling, that uh, is something that is not quite in scope, I would say for WIT, but should be in scope for our provider SDK. So the, the pieces that Jordan is working on for Go and the, the piece that um, uh, Taylor and Victor have been exploring for our Rust providers. Uh, so it's at that level that we would say, this is how we handle um, you know, retries, network failover, all of that type of stuff. Um, that's part of our provider SDK. WIT itself uh, does have an error type. Well, there's an error type within WASI uh, that all, almost all of the WASI interfaces uh, use and especially the WASI cloud ones. So you do get the error that you got, like say you were making an HTML request and you got a, a network fail. Um, but the level of how to handle that is gonna be at, at, a, at the SDK level. Right, but <clears throat> like the thing I ran into um, with 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 the current use in Wasm Cloud of Smithy is that rather than than Smithy's exception handling uh, in in Wasm Cloud, you have in band exceptions. You have you have to roll your own. Um, that's my understanding after empirical testing. Um, you know what I mean, like. Uh, it uh, an error is just other data in in, mm -hmm. in the current implementation. So there's not there's not actually an exception model. But in 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 the WIT IDL, you 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 are handling that, right? You, that's what you've just said. No, in the WIT IDL, you have a result type that is a. Uh, um the type on the second part of that tuple is an error. Uh, so you surface the error on a given request. Uh, and so what I was saying is it's at the SDK level. So it'll be at our provider SDK level to help you deal with at least some of the typical RPC failures that we know about um, and, and help you handle those types of exceptions. Uh, and it's out of scope for components and WIT. Okay, okay, so it's out of scope for components and wet. So, um, okay, I, I'll look, I need to do a deep dive on wet, so I'll do that. Thank you. Vance, yeah. I, I, I love the topic that you're on, and um, I would appreciate if you would maybe do one of your brain dumps in the Wasm Cloud Slack, it would be a great place to surface that. Um, I know that um, the entire BCA um, and you know Bailey's on the talk um, uh, are listening to that feedback um, to help drive prioritization to the roadmap. And um, we do have a roadmap blog post for the BCA that um, is in final stages of drafting. I'm supposed to I'm gonna try to get a pull request open on that shortly um, to get um, some of the details out so people can see the priorities. Uh, Bailey, over in chat, I, I dropped two links you may wanna pull up and just share. Um, 
real fast, a list of active proposals so that people can get an idea of what are the collections of proposals that uh, the Bytecode Alliance is prioritizing right now. Um, and specifically the first two that are slated to come down the pipe, which are WASI CLI or CLI or CLI, depending on uh, who you want to troll in the room, um, uh, as well as um, the WASI uh, proxy um, slash HTTP world. Um, um, and maybe you could just kind of give people an overview of that to, to go and Steve, I see you've got your hand up. I apologize, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Uh, yeah, yeah I've, I, I just, oh, I didn't mean to interrupt Bailey. No, go ahead, Steve. Um, also, thank you for your uh, diagrams. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Um, I think it, yeah, the right visualization can really be a powerful communicator. Um, I think that works well. Um, I, I think Vance's question is around uh, the distinction between uh, expected errors, which we, which we do in Rust with the return union, um, and uh, there's the whole other category of exceptions like traps and panics and, and stack enrolling. And, and I know that the Bytecode Alliance is working on ways to address that. Um, and then there's other models uh, like the Java model of, of try catch where every function in the stack doesn't need to have a, a handler for the error. Um, and that, that model doesn't really fit with, at least as far as I understand the, the um, uh, WebAssembly uh, machine execution model. Um, and so I, I think part, the way we did Smithy is um, more analogous to the way it's handled in Rust and WebAssembly. And I think, and I think WIT follows that model and I think it's partly constraint of WebAssembly, um, but I don't know if you could address the, the status of uh, traps and panic handling, if, if that's what Vance was asking about. Uh, thank you, Steve. Yeah, uh, I think um, you well stated what I, what I was getting at, which is the way that this is going to work is very similar to what we kind of already have and uh, how uh, the overall in, in WebAssembly um, exception handling has uh, has generated a lot of discussion. Uh, I have not seen that proposal make it all the way through. I want to say it's not in WASM time yet. Uh, so that... Um, I think at a lower level, right? Managed languages like Java handle um, exceptions and, and add an extra layer on top, right? And so things that are trying to have zero abstractions, uh, zero cost <laughs> abstractions, uh, and especially for a binary format like WASM and the component model with WASM, um, you, uh, you take a performance hit if you add those types of uh, functionality. So those those things we've been trying to come up with right designs. Um, there is a WebAssembly exception handling proposal, but I'm actually a little, I, I don't wanna speak to it too much because I, I know there's been a lot of discussion. I'm not sure where it's at right now. I think we, I think we're, um, I love the deep dive here in the discussion. Um, and I think this is, uh, we could talk about this um, extensively. But I want to kind of circle this off and tie this back to Jordan's point, uh, because Jordan was working on a parser um, uh, that is going to um, uh, help um, users that are in Go to have a Go specific way in order to create their templates um, um, using these definitions and contracts. And um, again, I think what Bailey, I really appreciate that you did was you highlighted the work that we're in the process of implementing right now in Wasm Cloud which is um, delivering on the component model vision um, so that we can um, execute around having multiple languages as components that are interchangeable and composable um, at a runtime um, as opposed to uh, compile time. Um, so I think this is gonna be super powerful um, uh, from, uh, you know, from, a, uh, from an implementation point of view. And I know that I'm really watching Roman's work that he's doing right now um, leading that uh, branch in Watson Cloud, but the whole team and half the people on this call are working on various pieces of that um, to get that work over the line. I'm super excited about the demos we're going to be able to give at WasmCon um, here in a couple months.
Sticky. Uh, Steve, just double checking that it was your hand up from from before. Did you have another um, another point? Okay. Wow, that was that was really awesome. Thank you, Bailey uh, and Liam and Vance and Frank for for all kind of going back and forth there. Uh, I always find that each one of these calls, I learn something more about what, something new about WebAssembly and, and understand it a little better. Which, uh, yeah, all I can hope is that it's as useful for for you all as it is for me. Um, I, I know that we have uh, one more agenda item that we're going to go ahead and move on to, but we will. We might have some time at the end of the call, so we're happy to continue some of this discussion uh, there as well. So just going back to the uh, agenda, the second thing that was on our list for today was discussing RFCs and ADRs in the Wasm Cloud organization. And there was a Slack thread that uh, that was going on in the Wasm Cloud Slack that, that made me really want to pay attention to this because over the last couple of months, especially, there have been some really exciting RFCs on the Wasm Cloud slide uh, side. And I think that a lot of them came from, well, <laughs> actually, if you look at them, a lot of them uh, Kevin wrote, and uh, a lot of them were pretty uh, exciting changes in the Wasm Cloud ecosystem, whether it's talking about our Rust-based host or defining interfaces using WIT, like all of these things are, are large, but I, I don't want RFCs to be something that are difficult to contribute as a community member or difficult to understand where we are in terms of implementing it. And I threw on this little label like RFC accepted, it's just basically something that's like, hey, you know, this is a thing that the maintainers decided we're, we're doing in Wasm Cloud, um, but that didn't seem like enough. So I wrote an RFC about RFCs, and I encourage you all to go check it out. I had a little too much fun uh, doing it, especially with the meme at the end. Um, but essentially what I wanted to put together was just, I, I don't want this to feel like an arduous process to deal with issues. And I think that if we had just a couple of simple labels for RFCs, in addition to just the blank RFC label indicating what it is, and an issue template, this would result in more people being willing to submit RFCs for things that they, they either have questions on or feature requests. Uh, I, I want it to be uh, easy to know what the status of the RFC is. So when someone new comes in and submits an issue using the issue template, it automatically comes in with the RFC proposed uh, label. This is just to say, hey, here's an RFC. We love some questions on it. We have the discussion needed label for when it's something that's either complex or needs some nuance or, or details teased out in, in terms of what we need to do. And then RFC accepted for when, you know, we've essentially, thanks Liam, see you later. Um, we've essentially teased out the biggest questions in this, uh, in, in this RFC and it's ready for implementation. And so, you know, two, the two biggest things here around the labels and, and what this RFC is trying to do is provide an easy understanding for anybody who's coming to the Wasm Cloud organization for where we are on some of these RFCs because they're important pieces of work. And then encourage people to be able to submit them on their own, even if you haven't written an RFC before and you don't know a format. This is something, um, this, this is not like a all uh, powerful format. It's just something that, you know, kind of coming up with. Um, so feel free to suggest changes to this. But I also want people to be able to find an accepted RFC for a feature that's pretty well scoped and described and actually implement that. Um, so, you know, this RFC accepted label should be an indication that, hey, this is ready for work. And if you're interested in contributing on the open source side, it's a great, great place to uh, give it a shot. So I saw the uh, I saw the chat and I didn't I don't think anything else big came in uh, there, but uh, I did link this there. I'll try to link this in the Wasm Cloud Slack as well. Please feel free to uh, to give me some comments. Um, and at this time, this is you know if we were using the uh, proposed labels, which I won't add yet. 
Uh, this RFC is certainly in the proposed status. So as long as we can get a couple of thumbs up or people leaving comments uh, in the community or on the maintainer side, we'd love to move this to RFC accepted, create those labels, get the issue template in, all that stuff. Um, this is probably a little heavy handed for setting things up, um, but I really want to try to execute that process. And I would also especially love some guidance for anyone who's worked in open source organizations before or have worked on projects that really feel like they have the RFC process down, something that was, you know, worked really well for them. I'm happy to take some uh, some inspiration from that. So uh, that's that's all that I had there. Oh, I did have one more thing. Um, but when I when I pause, does anybody have any questions or, or suggestions or just RFC experiences that they've worked with that just really felt great? That came out a little bit as a loaded question. I'm sure people who have had experiences with RFCs that felt great, but please feel free to drop uh, comments on that issue if if you have any thoughts and we'll go ahead and move this thing along. Yeah, thank you, Brooks. Uh, I, I would say um, the standard that I like to adhere myself to is the Kubernetes enhancement proposal process. I like that one. Um, can be a little heavier than I think uh, where we need to be right now with uh, the standards uh, actively evolving. Um, but uh, I think that's really good. Uh, I had a question about how this interacts with ADRs. That is actually the next thing that I had on my list. So thank you, Not Plant. Uh, some of you have noticed, if you look in the Wasm Cloud organization, I, I don't necessarily know if we have all of these front and center, but there is a uh, public repository for ADR. Um, and it, actually, right when you get to this repository, just a note, it, it's set up in kind of like an old GitHub pages way where all of the content is in the GitHub pages branch and not in the, the main branch. Uh, but you can also view it at wasm, or wasmcloud.github.io. Uh, uh, whatever. The, the link is in the repository. wasmcloud.github.io slash ADR. Thank you. So these are some of the uh, architecture decision logs, the big ones that we've uh, decided on in the Wasm Cloud organization um, or just across the project. Some of them are very baseline, like around using NATS in the first place. Some of them are around using NATS Jetstream, like further committing to some of the distributed uh, capabilities there. Um, and some of them are actually ADRs that we're going to, you know, retroactively comment on after uh, after the decision. So, you know, one of these uh, one of these ADRs around uh, uh, using Elixir OTP for the main cloud host runtime. There's a there's an open RFC in the Wasm Cloud uh, repository that kind of changes this. And I don't think that we need to look at this log as something that's completely. The, the decisions will be immutable, but they shouldn't be things that we never go back and reconsider. And so I just want to uh, call that to a specific attention. Um, in terms of what qualifies as an RFC and what qualifies as an ADR, I, I view RFCs uh, they, that they can be essentially of any scope. They can be anything from a beginner question about adding a feature to here is a large change that I would like to make to this project and, and I would like some, some comments on it. What I see applicable for ADRs and uh, are, um, I guess, kind of nebulously large architecture decisions that are, are things that we're kind of committing to in the project. Um, I wish I could find a little bit better words to describe that. And I'm sure if uh, I'm sure if Kevin was here, he'd have some, but things like for our communication across distributed network boundaries, we're going to use NATS as that technology foundation. So, so technology choices, um, large architecture decisions, things like that. Uh, deserve to be formalized in an ADR that's easy to go back and, and look through. Frank, I know you put your hand up um, somewhere in there. Uh, if you'll go, go ahead. So it would be nice to have uh, dates related to, I mean, so just the status is one thing, but then I think it would be interesting to see 
when was it accepted, and then if it was implemented or something, because just accepted means, okay, so there was a consensus in terms of, okay, makes sense, it's gonna be using, but it's already been used. So I think this would be something, I mean, because I, I think this the table itself is great. It shows you uh, what are the core cornerstones from the technology point of view, but it would be great if there was more information there, because otherwise you start digging into and say, okay, well, okay, it was accepted then, but then what? Okay, yeah, I, I really like that idea. I think that, you know, thankfully, because everything is in GitHub, we'll get to take advantage of like when things are dated there. But I, I heard your, your call out as, you know, in addition to just accepted, we should have uh, other uh, additional information around whether it's like work in progress, if it was accepted and then, you know, kind of got stale over time or if it's already been implemented and then in that case closed. Does that kind of capture what you're trying to say? Yes. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, I uh, I know we'll have this in the notes after the call. Um, Frank, feel free, if you, feel free if you'd like to put a comment on that that GitHub issue. You're, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I'll, I'll try and kind of capture that feedback and, and add it there as well. Okay. Bailey, I know that uh, that second part there kind of started with your question around, you know, what's the difference between an RFC and an ADR? Was that a satisfying answer for what you were looking for? That was great. I'm totally not a plant. Um, I think the other thing that we should start linking more towards, uh, and um, I feel like I, I like I need to, I need to swap hats here. So like, uh, Bytecode Alliance hat says uh, we need to get our roadmap published as soon as we can. Uh, we have one written. Um, I'm getting reviews from folks, uh, and then that should land soon. Uh, and then you can get a little bit more on dates for when a lot of these implementations of the standards uh, are going to be available. And then, um, you know, on the Wasm Cloud side, it'd be really great to show where we've been trying to line up with that roadmap so that uh, we're as aligned with the standards as we possibly can be. Yeah, I really like that idea, Bailey. And I know that we've done a couple of things around like setting up GitHub projects and, and like organizing issues in, into things. Um, I think we did decide that GitHub had proper enough functionality for for a roadmap. So I think it's I think it's probably time that we formalize that and and actually just get that up. That'd be nice. Yeah. So we should jam. It sounds like we've got RFC ADR uh, project party coming up. Yeah, and it would be neat to. I think one of the other things that would be nice to work on is you know taking these ADRs and pushing them into the main Wasm Cloud repository, um, or even if RFCs end up getting you know immortalized a little more than a GitHub issue, like in a in a PR, and then it goes into a folder or something. It would. Did we already do that? I'm not a plan for myself. I don't remember if we did it or not. We did do that. Look at that. Okay, hold on. Uh, Okay, this is a great idea that we definitely should do that we already did, which is moving the ADRs into the Wasm Cloud repo. Great stuff. Um, I really like the, you know, I, I really like having this in the in the central place. Do you just plant for yourself? That that's impressive. Um, we do. We're not done here, right? Like we need to make sure the website now points to this artifact, uh, and I also want to make sure we we highlight it more on the Wasm Cloud. Uh, you know, our our docs and where you have the community part. Like I, I think we need to get more visibility around this kind of stuff. Uh, Victor. Hey, uh, question. I was wondering if it makes sense for the RFCs to fold into the ADRs. Right. Uh, it sounds like, you know, an RFC is early and ADR is sort of after, right? And at some point with the passage of time, early becomes after, right? So it feels like they should be, uh, they should be linked. Does that make sense? Like, is that, is that reasonable? That, that does make sense. And, you know, it, my, my first, yeah, my, my first thought is like, well, then maybe we shouldn't have two different words for it. 
but I think that actually makes sense. You propose a feature or a question and you ask for comments and then once it's accepted and committed, it can go into our decision record. Um, I, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I did like also, um, I think what, I think Frank um, noted the um, how how it it um, it's like the cornerstones of the of the technology, right? Like things you should know about uh, Wasm Cloud. I, I think so. So I think that's that's really important. I, I think also as a feature. So I guess the, that those would be like my two things is just making sure, or if there's a link between RFCs and ADRs that they should be properly like they should reflect that link or there, sh there should be like you know that should be a, a little bit easier to tell i guess and then yeah I, I i like the idea of a document that just tells you like you should know about nats right or just you should know that this is how we get the awesome you know route anywhere don't worry about the mesh capability right like while everyone else is like struggling with service meshes or sto or whatever right like we just have like it's solved and this is how it's solved kind of deal uh yeah, that'd be, that'd be pretty cool. I think I think then I'll add to my RFC about RFCs that the condition to close an RFC is either like closing the issue saying, hey, you know, we're not going to work on this or submitting a PR with an ADR like markdown link and saying, hey, this closes the RFC. I, I think that's a that's a fantastic um way to kind of conceptualize closing the, the RFC with the decision log. Yay. Um, and then Victor, I think your your other point around, you know, just kind of key concepts of of Wasm Cloud certainly should be in the, I mean, they're they're kind of like projected from the ADR saying things like, hey, we're going to use NATS and we're going to use these signing keys, but we, we can um we can kind of put that together, I think, on the documentation um side. That that sounds like a great idea. All right, everyone. Well, I know that we're uh, about at the top of the hour here, so I, I don't think I want to start any new uh, big topics just because we'll, we'll probably run over. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Does anybody else have any other questions, just general uh, feedback or, or even questions from the, the earlier topics that we had today? All right, everyone. Well, then I think I'll go ahead and end the community stream. Thank you, everyone who came uh, on the if you're you're watching on YouTube or Twitter or whatever. Uh, thanks for thanks for watching. I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. We can all hang out for, for